We could have been the second El Salvador since November and it's just being held back because of this. From all things that you have listed, it seems like the country is ready for Bitcoin adoption. In terms of oil development, we'll actually be one of the richest nations in the world. Imagine if you could have been in El Salvador before it became legal tender, right? I'm talking about Bitcoin and Bitcoin adoption and nation state adoption, which is uh, one of my favorite topics. I had a lot of people from El Salvador on uh, and yeah, I hope Suriname can be the, the second El Salvador. <laughs> Definitely. That is my hope as well. Um, you know, even though it wouldn't be bad if another country beats us to it, I mean, I'd be happy with that uh, as well. But it would be great if, um, you know, we could be on the map as the second uh, country. Uh, great. So it's like the target for you to, to drive the Bitcoin adoption in Suriname. So like legal tender, Bitcoin mining, like what, what are like the goals for Suriname? Or maybe let's let's take a step back because we talked about before. Um, what, what is Suriname? Like what, what is the country all about? Uh, where is it? What what language? I think Dutch it is. Uh, maybe let's take let's make a quick overview of Suriname, the, the country for the people that don't know about it. Sure. So Suriname is on the northern coast of South America. Um, we're right above Brazil. Um, so you see three small countries. You see Guyana uh, next to Venezuela, and then you see Suriname and French Guyana, and then the rest is Brazil. It's a very, well, actually by land mass, it's, it's pretty big um, in comparison to El Salvador, for example. It's about six times the size. Don't hold me to that, but about. Um, but it's 93% forested. Um, so it's actually pretty small in terms of population. Uh, we have about 600,000 people. Um, so it's kind of like a little village uh, in terms of size, just of the, po of the population itself. We have a pretty small economy, 3.2 billion. Um, it's, uh, it's like stepping back into time, into the 1980s a little bit um, in terms of technology and financial infrastructure. You barely have, like, we don't have the same debit cards, for example, that you have in Europe or in the U.S., like uh, what you're used to using, right? It usually it has um, Maestro or uh, MasterCard or Visa on it. So your regular debit card uh, from the bank works everywhere in the world. Um, in Suriname, we have the Surinamese dollar, um, which is our national currency. And it, we have about 50 to 60 percent inflation annually. Uh, which is very sad, but also very good for Bitcoin. <laughs> um, but basically, you can't use your debit card anywhere in the world. Um, you can only, only use it locally. And it's at these very archaic um, POS systems that don't have NFC. So it, there's no tap to pay, um, no chip payments. Um, or like some debit cards have it, not all. Online banking is a pain. Uh, local transfers, like just sending money from person to person takes about one to three business days, um, on average three, if, if, if it's two different banks. Um, so it's, it's cumbersome to just transact here. Um, it's primarily cash based. A lot of people still use cash. A lot of people prefer, uh, foreign currencies over the Surinamese dollar because of that inflation. So they tend to save in either us dollar or euros. Um, most apartments, most um, real estate transactions are still done in euro or US dollars. Um, so most people don't even pay their rent or, uh, you know, buy a house or whatever in SRD. Um, so it's, it's, it's still a lot of hedging that's happening just naturally into foreign currencies. Um, we have a very beautiful Amazon rainforest, mountains, river rapids, waterfalls. Um, it's just beautiful to see uh, the biodiversity specifically as well. It's a lot of untouched Amazon rainforest and we have um, indigenous tribes of Maroons and um, just native Indians. And they still live, um, you know, very much as they've lived for the last hundreds of years. Um, so that is really great to see. And uh, we have our city is like, um, yeah, how do I explain this? Our city is not really a city. It's like it, it's not, uh, or it's not a city like you know in the general sense. Um, so our city isn't really um, a city in the, 
it, like you'd you'd be used to in in Europe or any other country. It's um, it's very small. It's a UNESCO heritage site actually, and it's still all the old buildings from the colonial times when the we were still a Dutch colony. Um, so it's all wood. It's all very old. Um, it is it is maintained, um, but it's all one story max, two stories. You know, you don't have skyscrapers or big cr- concrete buildings here. So it's it's all a lot of nature. It's actually really fascinating to see, and we have amazing wildlife. We have um, you know leatherback turtles coming here every year to lay their eggs and breed and. Um, then the hatchlings uh, going out to sea. Um, that's a beautiful thing to see as well. And yeah, there's a, there's since 1975, since we've gained our independence, there's been a lot of uh, government corruption because we have a vast amount of natural resources. We have a lot of gold. Mm. And aside from gold, we also have oil onshore and offshore oil deposits and offshore oil is estimated to be more than Qatar. So in terms of oil development, we'll actually be one of the richest nations in um, in the world uh, over the next decade. So a lot of resources, but not as much development flowing back to the people or to, you know, just into the economy. There's a lot of theft by government, a lot of corruption, a lot of, um, a lot of scandals every year, almost um, every other month or every month uh, one comes out. Um, so people don't trust government. People don't trust the central bank. People don't trust the banks. Um, the average interest rate for a mortgage here is like 12% if you're lucky and you have um, a, uh, a foreign currency income. And if you don't, in SRD, it's about eighteen to nineteen percent. So just imagine paying that as a you know as as your monthly uh, to, to to be able to buy a house. So a lot of restrictions. Uh, we don't have a capital market. So what Satoshi built Bitcoin for? That whole system of centralization and then you know how it being as rigged as it is in international capital markets. Uh, we have no capital market whatsoever it is a laptop going around with an excel sheet um once a month <laughs> yeah so that's how we, that's how we trade stocks um so it's it's um it's there's a big gap in terms of technology development and and financial infrastructure but that also creates a unique opportunity because we have a very small population of only 600,000 about 240,000 live in the city um, so we have small communities uh, that are just primed for adoption and we have the, the lack of financial infrastructure and the lack of, um, you know, just the, the simple things that you take, take for granted in, in the U.S. or even in El Salvador. In El Salvador, they already had pretty e- easy to use financial infrastructure before they adopted Bitcoin as legal tender. We, we don't even have that here. So the use case is even better than, than El Salvador. You can literally show them you know with wall of satoshi of blink if i orange pill someone and i show them how it works they're just like mind blown so creates a unique opportunity for bitcoin adoption here um we've been working on a bitcoin center for the last year and i've been working on pushing for bitcoin adoption here for the last six years um it was was an uphill struggle but it's it it's gotten a lot easier ever since El Salvador, actually. Um, you know, with, with Blink coming out, with um, easier to use, user friendly or wallets, it's it's a lot easier for people to learn how um, how easy it is to use Lightning. And is it is the main part of Bitcoin adoption? Like uh, one country does it uh, for the second country, it's a little bit easier than the first country, and that like, there's like this snowball effect going on. Uh, and in fascinating country, like what I noted down is like it's half the population of Vienna, uh, but like twenty x the size or something like that because it's like uh, a lot, a lot of forests. Uh, and from all things that you have listed, it seems like the country is like ready for Bitcoin adoption. Like <laughs> let's let's have a Bitcoin standard there. And especially when you think about the dominance of the US dollar and the euro, because what 
when you basically use the US dollar and the euro, what you're doing is like you are importing the inflation that other countries are doing in their uh, currency. Like when the US dollar is uh, devalued because they invest in their own country, they invest in their own stuff, they are exporting inflation in all the other countries that are using the US dollar. There's like 66 countries or something like that that actually as the official currency use them. And there are other countries like Suriname that are kind of have the official currency with the uh, euro and the dollar where uh, the most of them like to use them instead of the Suriname dollar, uh, which is fascinating for me. Um, this is kind of like, I wanted to ask you what motivated you to <laughs> to, to get into Bitcoin, uh, but it, it, it basically was that situation that you saw in Suriname, right? Well, it's it's one of the reasons why I wanted to push for adoption or why I want to push for adoption here. Um, because I, when I read the white paper, I was like, okay, this is the holy grail. This, you know, it's going to be huge. Um, and that was around 2012. Um, but I still was a, a little bit, you know, holding back. Like, okay, let's see where it goes. Is it going to get some traction? Is it going to increase? Um, like, is the network uh, going to increase? Is it going to scale? Um, and how will the technology develop over time? Um, but just because I was also obsessed with tech stocks from an early age and, and just the capital markets in, in, you know, growing up and I, you, you kind of learn that markets move in cycles when you start early on and then, you know, you know, when uh, the next recession or about when the next recession, according to that cycle is supposed to come. And if you, you know, if you know what to look for, then you kind of already knew that 2008 was coming and it came like exactly as, as, as planned on time. And then reading the white paper, you kind of realize like, holy shit, this is the solution. This is what we need. And that is kind of how I like just how I how, how I transitioned from okay this is what we need to fix the problem in the U.S. to like okay this is what we need to to fix everything and sue basically because we don't have the payment infrastructure we don't have capital market infrastructure we don't have much of of what you already have in in developed nations so I I saw it as an opportunity for our country to develop on a Bitcoin standard so on on the latest technology and you know it's the the payment layer on the internet and i i just see i just already saw it as as the future and i i went completely all in in 2017 and just haven't looked back since then amazing uh and how does like the current officials the current government the current uh people you said there's a lot of scandals going on a lot of corruptions they probably don't like Bitcoin that much. Uh, how do how do they react to, to those Bitcoin proposals and that Bitcoin could be a solution for their country? Well, actually, we had so we had Jan three here in November. Uh, Samson and and Ben Fahol came here, and um, they had conversations with industry leaders, with the Banking Commission, with the Central Bank, um, with uh, the President and the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And the president in the meeting said he wants to be a global leader in terms of Bitcoin technology and adoption. He wants to follow the example of El Salvador and he wants to push for, you know, attracting foreign investment and attracting talent into the country. And he was actually very pro Bitcoin adoption. And he said his uh, presidential advisor has to evaluate Gendry's proposal and then based on that, they, you know, they would proceed. And then it, it looked like things were taking like long, way too long than they, than they should. And I'm, I'm very well connected here just because of, you know, my companies, I'm an entrepreneur here in the country. I've been for uh, 21 years. So I have a broad uh, network in the private sector, the financial sector, and also directly to these politicians. So I actually contacted uh, the chairman of eGov, uh, who is the, the president's advisor, uh, shortly after Samson came. And I had asked him, you know, um, 
uh, well, what's the holdup? Like, why is it taking so long? This is something that could have been done in like two to three days. Why is it taking so long? And then he informed me that he was mining Bitcoin, um, that he had personally invested 20 million into mining Bitcoin at Paranam uh, for about, uh, and had reserved 20 megawatts uh, in electricity and was already mining 10 megawatts. And that he didn't want the public opinion of, of Bitcoin to to taint what he was doing and he didn't want it to be publicly known that he was mining. He wanted to keep it small and silent. And, um, you know, I thought, okay, let's just let the government do their thing. It's, you know, it's bureaucracy. They need to install a payment commission that needs to evaluate and, and it's just regular bureaucracy. So I gave it some time and then I kept getting, uh, more information on this mining site and how it was structured. Uh, like I, I received uh, a notice that there was a uh, a meeting at the Ministry of Finance with the Minister of Finance and uh, our energy company on this, this specific topic, this mine. And then it was still silent after that. Nothing happened. So I started to, you know, like more red flags and, and questions started popping up. And I kept receiving more information about this mine. And then I think it was two two weeks ago to, yeah, two weeks ago, a month ago, I did a podcast about it. And then I received more information. And then since it started about two weeks ago that I've been on TV a lot and uh, on local uh, media a lot about this mine, because apparently he's been mining at a rate that is similar to only one private company. And that is the Rosabel Gold Mine. So he's he's mining at the same rate at the, as the Rosabel Gold Mine in private. He's not paying any taxes or anything on it. And he's been mining since April 2022. And the worst part is they've increased prices since last year for, you know, just regular retail use and retail users in a country where people can barely afford to, to survive at this point while this man is mining with subsidized energy and you know that the whole point of my proposal because i was a part of e-government in 2020 he he recruited me in in e-gov specifically for the development of the capital market and the exchange and for bitcoin adoption and i pitched this to him i told him we should start mining bitcoin as a strategy for the country we should start um you know it's, it's a way to convert SRD into Bitcoin and get more foreign capital into the country and directly into the hands of people. And he just went and he did it privately without anyone, like the public has no idea. Nobody knew that he was doing this since April, 2022. And now it's just kind of blown up and I'm a, a whistleblower here. So everybody's, you know, keeps texting me to be careful and, and, be careful with these people because you know my life might be in danger and I, 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 I think I, last year I kind of made peace with that but um, I've been you know on on the media for, for the last couple of weeks uh, actually talking about this massive scandal because basically it's nepotism at its core right you have the presidential advisor that is mining Bitcoin about a tenth of the current capacity of the dam because it's uh it's low water levels and they're they're actually doing um god how do you say this in english they're actually doing rolling blackouts um so load shedding because there is uh, not enough capacity to power the entire city and while this is happening while you're increasing rates for people while the economy has already gone down as much as it's, go it's gone down while there's 50 to 60 percent inflation you could have actually just fixed this problem already with the mining capacity that you've had since 2022 and aside aside from that fact he's doing it completely in private so nobody knows what's what's happening there and all you're doing this since 2022 something as simple as an executive order to recognize bitcoin as you know legal tender something that should take three three two to three days max you're 
basically preventing that from happening because you don't want public opinion about what you're doing or want what you're doing to be known. So we just uncovered this scandal. It's uh, It's been in the news for the last two weeks. Um, I, the president is not happy with me at the moment. Uh, neither is his neither, neither is a, his advisor. Um, so yeah, that's it's it's uh, it's a touchy subject at the moment. But I have been advocating for you know adoption because recognizing it, it as legal tender and, and and you know not preventing adoption just solely for the interests of one person that it benefits the entire country. And this man is just preventing economic development of this country because of his own self-interest. And it, it, it's just mind-boggling to me. So I, I've, I've been, I've been, uh, yeah, I've been very vocal <laughs> about it. Is, is, is it fair to say that uh, corruption then holds back Suriname's uh, adoption of Bitcoin and basically... Is it fair to say that corruption in Suriname holds back the being the second El Salvador? Yes, we could have been the second El Salvador since November, and it's just being held back because of this. And you know, I've I've come out publicly, spoken about this, and I, and I'll be speaking about this more and getting more light shed on this because it's been in the news the last couple of weeks. Um, it's it's in the news the, the last week constantly and there's more articles coming out more interviews i've, I've done a lot to, to express how it you know benefits the people and how you cannot prevent adoption just for the benefit of one person or one private company right um so i'll be speaking more about it and it is literally corruption that is holding this back and yeah it's 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 just mind-blowing like so we have a saying in this country um, everything is possible with God and in Surya. And it's just the amount of the amount of scandals and the amount of things that uh, like the the audacity of corruption in this country because this government is the worst by far of any government we've ever had. Like this government does not give a fuck. Like they're they're corrupt and You'll catch them being corrupt. You'll you, there will be a big scandal, and then they'll just lie to your face about it. And then in a week, everybody will have for, forgotten. Like even our attorney general at this point is being politically coerced. Like there's no prosecution happening for scandals that should have been prosecuted or at least um, investigated. They don't even investigate. And, you know, reporters have been uh, like pretty held back for the last year because they're afraid of repercussions by government because some have been beaten up and some have lost their jobs or have been threatened. Um, so since my interview came out about a month ago on a Dave podcast, I highlighted that fact. I said journalists are afraid to to report, to to give away information to report the news like what are we living in a communistic country what is this supposed to become venezuela like you know i highlighted it like that and since then i see that journalists are being more vocal again or are, are, are you know trying to, to fight back more and with elections coming up next year you also have you know all these po other political parties and the opposition uh getting more traction and coming out more vocally about all this corruption um, so it should be exciting, like an exciting couple of months. If you are listening to this podcast, you might be wondering what is actually the setup look like of Robin or how can I improve my Bitcoin setup? And there's two things. You have to buy Bitcoin from the right source and you have to store Bitcoin the right way. Let's focus on the first thing how to buy Bitcoin. It's simple. Have a Bitcoin only exchange. Don't deal with the shitcoin exchanges. Don't deal with an exchange that has an own token or something like that. Be on a Bitcoin only exchange. I use 21 Bitcoin. 21 Bitcoin is for me the best partner for that. And now where do you store Bitcoin? Bitcoin should be stored on a hardware wallet, on a self-custody solution where you yourself 
all your keys and it should be a cold wallet. So that's my simple solutions. That's a Bitbox. You just put your Bitcoin on there, back up your seed phrase, and you are better than 95% of all Bitcoin hodlers. If you have more than a thousand euros in Bitcoin, it's an absolutely must have. One last thing before we get back to the video. I'm really passionate about meeting other Bitcoiners. And there's an amazing opportunity in the middle of Europe in June, the Bitcoin Prague Conference. It's the best and biggest Bitcoin only conference in the whole of Europe. For all Americans, please visit Europe and visit this place in June. For all Europe's, it's a must go anyways. You are so close to the Bitcoin Prague conference, you basically have to come. I will do interviews there and I would love to meet you all there. Use code ROBIN for all my sponsors to get discounts and use the links down in the description. And hopefully Bitcoin as legal tender very soon. Uh, is there anything the international audience and the Bitcoin community can do to uh, support Suriname, uh, the Bitcoin adoption there, support you in being the uh, uh, front runner in the elections? Well, anything that the Bitcoin community can do to help, specifically on the ground here, like just imagine if you could have been in El Salvador before it became legal tender, right? Imagine if you could be um, working with a candidate on the ground in a very small country with 240,000 people in the city. So it's it's pretty easy to, to, to like go around and start onboarding merchants and, and helping and um, creating more awareness. Specifically, we need help with fundraising because um, our campaign is not I'm not a politician. I, I'm an entrepreneur. You know, I, I started an import company 21 years ago. I uh, started an infrastructure company about 10 years ago. So I have two companies in this country. And I, I really don't need to go into politics. I actually didn't want to until Samson kind of pushed me over the edge in November. He's like, yeah, you should you should do it. You should run. And, and I really, yes, yes, I should. Um, and, you know, politicians have been trying to convince me for the last six years and I didn't want to join any existing political party. Um, but after conversations here with um, existing party leaders and, you know, leaders of captains of industry and influential leaders here, um, knowing that they support and they'd support my approach because my approach would not be political at all. It is very rigorous and and very you know to the point. Like like I'd run a business, um, which means and, and a, a massive overhaul, privatization, um, privatization of a lot of government ministries, transitioning about forty thousand people that work for government at the moment, about sixty percent of our working population, trans transferring transitioning them into other industries. Um, diversifying into technology, making Bitcoin the unit of account because I don't just want to make it legal tender. I want Suriname to be on a Bitcoin standard because our, our SRD has failed us since 1975. Like our, our local currency, it, it hasn't served this country at all. And just imagine people earning a salary in Satoshis, going to the supermarket, the pricing being in Satoshis, Seeing it go down in comparison to the import prices, right? It's all going to be in fiat. Seeing fiat lose its value in relation to what you earn in. So, it, and especially with the amount of resources we've had, we've, we have, we've, we've done the calculations. And with the existing resources we have right now, we can actually have a very prosperous population on a Bitcoin standard. So I, I'd ask the Bitcoin community to come here to reach out, you know, reach out to me on um, on X or or join the the, the Bitcoin Center on Telegram group. Reach out there in whatever way you can support, whether it be marketing, creating video content, um, helping, you know, orange fill people here on the ground. Education is very important. We, you know, we have we recently launched. Our, our first uh, FEDI federation here. So there's now a, a community of about 1,300 families that are um, in a soccer academy 
and they're learning to save in in Bitcoin and using that federation. So that is, um, you know, it's it's already starting, but we need more support in terms of education, in terms of funding specifically, because like the 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 federation itself, for example, they need they need funding just for for their program. And getting funding here from the private sector with an economy that's already tanked, uh, you know, for the last three years, it's it's pretty difficult. And things here aren't that expensive. You know, the average salary here is between 150 to 175 US, which is very low. If you could hire people here remote, like imagine if you could hire 10 people here remote, right? 1750 US a month to go door to door to teach people how to use Blink or go to merchants to, to spread the Bitcoinized POSs, uh, spread NFC cards, uh, just simple things like that. That is already a 1750 US that 10 people are being paid in in Bitcoin that they can spend. And that is what we need. We need more Bitcoin flowing into our economy. We need more people being paid in, in, in Bitcoin. So that that is something that will help. Um, we're not cam- campaigning like a traditional political party here. We're not doing, you know, all of the fake promises and nonsense that they're doing and, and going around from, from city to city or town to town. We have specific um, projects, projects that I had already been working on uh, with the orphanages, with, um, you know, old people homes, with assisted living facilities, and uh, just education in general. So just supporting in those projects already helps. Like if you can support in any way, whatever way possible for any of those projects, and specifically education would be amazing if we can get more Bitcoiners to help with teaching um, tech or, or um, you know, having a platform for kids um, 17 and above and adults to be able to learn, you know, development on lightning, for example, if you can roll that out here, any assistance is, is welcome and, and, and everything helps Bitcoin adoption, right? So it's not waiting until the elections next year. We're helping adoption right now because there's still a lot of grassroots efforts help like working, um, happening on the ground where we're still working every day to increase adoption here. We have a monthly meetup where more than 100 people come to listen and learn. So the community is growing, the community is here. Um, whether this government does it and they make themselves se- second and put themselves on the map or I you know, win the elections next year, which is a very high probability because I swear to God, if you look at interviews of these people and just do some research on the amount of corruption that has happened and just the amount of support that I myself get from both the large existing political parties as well as the smaller political parties, then you'd realize that there's no one in this country with a vision to develop this country and there's no one in this country with a vision to develop it looking towards 2030, 2035 and where the, the world is heading in terms of technological advancement and, and development, right? With AI and quantum computing and, and just the progress that's happening internationally and what's happening in the Bitcoin um, industry, people don't know or don't realize or they're still stuck in in Web3 mumbo jumbo. So if you just do the research, you'll see that my odds are very very much well stacked in my favor. So in whatever way you can come and help adoption, it's it's very much appreciated. It's amazing to hear that... uh small countries have a chance and actually have the the hope uh, in in persons they are helping them uh, grow up uh, and and get to a full bitcoin adoption i feel like the this would not even been possible in in austria because the system is working too good that people want to do any change and i feel like that's the um that's a chance for countries like suriname where like there are those big problems and this can be a major chance for Suriname to actually uh, be one of the uh, leaders, even though with just 600,000 people, it's like half of the population of the Austrian um, uh, capital, 
but still 600,000 people are 600,000 people. Uh, and it would be uh, massive to have more than just El Salvador also on the map. It, uh, can, I can only encourage anybody to just like support with whatever they, they can uh, and support that thing. Um, what I was not 100% sure when you said like Bitcoin as a unit of account, would that mean ditching the Suriname co a dollar completely or? Uh, <laughs> yes. Nice. Yes. Yes, just scrapping it from existence. Uh, it's been done before by previous governments. And it, like it was the, the Surinamese Florin, and then it was the Surinamese Gilder, and then it was the Surinamese Dollar. Um, so it's been done before because of inflation. And I see no reason, aside from like li literally the only problem might be um, certain exports. Right, because then certain exports become pricey because then it is increasing in price in relation to every other fiat currency. Um, so we we've thought up some solutions on that um, and how to you know protect those sectors. But basically, it would be the we're we're mainly an import economy. We import more than that we export, and we don't need to export our gold. We can keep it here and issue it, for example, on liquid. Right then, we'd have the same amount of of exports, but the gold could remain here, or in a vault in Switzerland, whatever they'd require. But basically, we could actually keep our resources here and maintain that source of income. So there's no reason why we couldn't completely transition to a Bitcoin standard and then just be a country that just lives on Bitcoin. Because I see it as a way to instead of having people lose. 50 to 60 percent to infl inflation every year having them you know see an increase in value and also if you don't have the u.s dollar as an intermediary if they just earn in satoshis if they just earn um in bitcoin then they're not going to see fluctuations in u.s dollar they're just going to see depreciation of the u.s dollar right so it's actually better for them and it actually is, it will be, I think, the first population to actually live completely on a Bitcoin standard and, and have that, that the, the, the full benefit of what Bitcoin has to offer and that it actually fulfills what it was developed for with, within an entire country on it. And it also forces companies to, you know, now you have companies like MicroStrategy, Block, they, they put it in their treasury. Which is a nice proof of concept. Like we we see how MicroStrategy is is doing with that, right? This would force every company to use Satoshi's as their unit of account, and their revenue would be in Satoshi's. Their profits would be in Satoshi's. Their treasuries would be in Satoshi's. So we'd make every company in Suriname, small, medium, large, into a mini MicroStrategy. That's amazing. Just imagine that. And yeah, that is that is what we've been waiting for, right? Hyper Bitcoinization. They uh, hear that Bitcoin wins, and I, I truly think this is the way. And I think uh, when you have a country that is adopting it so early and so fast, uh, this means that you have a massive, massive benefit from it. Like there is, uh, as I always say, even the last person, even the last country that will adopt the Bitcoin standard will benefit from it. But if you're early on. You will uh, benefit from its properties and from its adoption. Mm -hmm. So when you are last, you will only benefit from its uh, properties of Bitcoin. But if you are early on, you even uh, benefit from it being adopted in a rapid pace. So that's that's something really beautiful that uh, uh, can happen to Suriname, and I hope uh, it will happen. Um, you talked a little bit uh, about uh, the scandals and uh, um, corruption in in, in Suriname. Are you in any way, shape, or form afraid that the election might be rigged? Isn't that funny? Exactly at the moment when I asked Maya, are the elections rigged? <laughs> exactly at the moment, unfortunately, uh, her internet fallout. And we tried to do a continuation of that, like just uh, five days later, like we recorded on Tuesday. Then on Sunday, we tried again. 
the internet was still not working in Suriname uh, and for her like the data was working but it was a really bad internet so it was hard to make a remote podcast with that um, and she's She said it will be probably back up nicely in one month. So what we decided is let that podcast as it is because it's really valuable. And we will start the next podcast that we will have with Maya in one month. Probably it will be out uh, in like one and a half months or two months, something like that, uh, as like kind of a part two, but uh, as a own episode for Maya uh, about rigged elections and uh, more questions about that. But I still wanted to have this podcast episode as one whole thing out right now because I feel like people could learn from that and can get something inside uh, get some insights from that so hopefully you enjoyed it hopefully you, you liked it uh, and yeah I, I will close the episode unfortunately without an end routine which I really hate but we cannot always get what we want I guess <laughs> But the overlords uh, shut us down. Uh, in that sense, uh, we will be back soon. And uh, I will now with that uh, episode, I will fulfill a request I got a lot in my comment sections because people think that I sound like Arno Schwarzenegger, which is a huge compliment for me. Uh, but I just don't think that I sound like Arno Schwarzenegger. Like I probably could sound like him if I trying to do that but I, f I don't feel like that i actually sound like him but i will still do it uh, and this is my first time i'll do it on a podcast so i'll be back